This video is brought to you by Stony Labs. Use code WHEELER for 10% off at checkout. In the modern world, pain is the enemy. It's the alarm system we can't turn off, the raw electrical signal that hijacks our nerves, floods our brain, and overrides everything else. And for most of human history, we were losing. Broken bones, pulled teeth, battlefield wounds, every cut, every burn, every surgery. Done while fully awake or sometimes drunk. But then chemistry stepped in. In the never-ending war between humanity and pain, Chemists became the resistance. We fight back, not with swords, but with molecules. The first ever chemical weapon we had in this battle was cocaine. In the 1880s, scientists discovered that cocaine could numb tissue and block pain right at its source. For a brief moment, it seemed like a miracle. Eye surgeries, dental work, amputations, all became possible without screaming agony. But cocaine has a dark side. It's not just an anesthetic. It's a powerful, addictive stimulant and has dangerous side effects, which quickly became impossible to ignore. Chemists knew they could do better. In 1890, German scientist Edward Ritzert introduced benzocaine, the first synthetic local anesthetic that offered the numbing power of cocaine without the addictive high or severe toxicity. Unlike cocaine, benzocaine was designed to stay where it was needed, working on the surface without racing through the bloodstream and into the brain. It was simpler, safer, and more effective. This became the model for many anesthetics that would follow. Today, we're stepping back into the shoes of those early chemists, recreating benzocaine from basic building blocks, and tracing the story of how this humble molecule helped make modern surgery possible. Because if pain is the villains, we're the ones writing the chemical counterattack. Now let's head to the lab and get to work. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you know I love toluene. It's a great starting block, and we could do that today, but I've already walked through the same reaction path in other videos, just starting with benzene, to end up instead with aniline. So to keep things moving, I'm going to skip ahead and start with P-tyluidine, which you could make using similar chemistry to those videos, just starting with tyluene. I start by adding 6.5 milliliters of concentrated hydrochloric acid to 175 milliliters of distilled water in a beaker. Next I weigh out 7.5 grams of P-tyluidine and add that to the beaker. The acid helps dissolve the P-tyluidine by reacting with it to form a water-soluble hydrochloride salt. This step is critical because p tyludine itself doesn't dissolve very well in water, but once it forms the salt, the amine group becomes protonated and more polar, allowing it to dissolve completely. Now the solution looks murky or brownish, which can happen due to impurities. Aromatic amines oxidize slightly and cause discoloration, giving the mixture a yellowish or brownish tint. To take care of this, I add 3 grams of activated carbon, also known as decolorizing charcoal. This acts as a magnet for colorized impurities binding them to the porous surface of the carbon. I stir the mixture gently for a few minutes in it. I stir the mixture gently for a few minutes to give the charcoal some time to work. I then filter the solution using some filter paper and collect the clean solution into the next reaction vessel. While it's filtering, I prepare a solution of 12 grams of sodium acetate in 40 milliliters of water. This is going to act as a buffering agent in the later reaction. Sodium acetate helps keep the pH in a range where acetylation happens efficiently, but minimizes side reactions. Once the p-tyludine hydrochloride is filtered and transferred into the 500ml 3-nex flask, I then warm the flask gently to about 50 degrees Celsius using a heating mantle. This helps speed up the acetylation reaction that's about to happen. Now comes the acetylation steps. I measure out 8.7 grams or roughly 8 milliliters of acetic anhydride. This is our acetylating agent, and is quite reactive, so I add it carefully while a magnetic stir bar helps mixing in the flask, to make sure it dissolves completely. Immediately after adding the acetic anhydride, I mix in our sodium acetate solution. This raises the pH slightly, making the environment more favorable for acetylation. Acetic anhydride reacts with the amino group on the p toluidine to form an amine linkage. This is how we're making p acetotoluidide We can see a solid material start to form. To make sure all our product is out of solution, I place the flask into an ice bath. The colder temperature reduces solubility and helps our product, p crystallize out of solution. Once the crystals have fully formed, I collect them using vacuum filtration. I rinse them with cold water to remove any residual sodium acetate or acetic acid that might be clinging to the crystals. Then I place the filter cake onto a watch glass and dry it overnight. My final yield is about 6.1 grams. Now we're going to take this product and transform it into p acetaminobenzoic acid. I begin by adding 6.1 grams of our previous product into a 1 liter round bottom flask, followed by 16.3 grams of hydrated magnesium sulfate and 400 milliliters of distilled water. 
I set the flask onto a steam bath and bring the mixture up to about 85 degrees Celsius. It's important to use gentle, even heating and not to let it boil too hard, just enough to keep things hot and fluid. While it's warming up, I prepare the oxidizing reagent. In a separate beaker, I dissolve 16.7 grams of potassium permanganate in 100 milliliters of boiling water. Potassium permanganate is a powerful oxidizer, and it's going to oxidize the methyl group on the P-acetylutaldine to a carboxylic acid, transforming it into P-amine acetobenzoic acid. Since permanganate can stain skin and destroy organics on contact, I'm making sure to wear gloves and goggles. Once both solutions are ready, I start oxidizing. I stir the hot P-acetotylidide solution vigorously and begin to add the hot permanganate solution, a little at a time over the course of about 30 minutes. This part requires patience. Dumping it in too quickly risks over-oxidizing the product, essentially burning it up chemically and reducing our yield. So I add it slowly and keep things swirling to make sure it's evenly mixed, making sure the purple color doesn't build up too much at once. After all the permanganate has been added, I continue to stir for an extra few minutes to ensure the reaction has gone to completion. At this point, manganese dioxide, a brown or blackish solid, has precipitated out. That's a byproduct from the permanganate being reduced. I filtered this off while everything is still hot. If the filtrate is still purple, this means that there is some unreacted permanganate left. To fix this, I add about 6 milliliters of ethanol and boil the solution briefly. Ethanol reduces any leftover permanganate without harming our desired product. I then filter through a fresh filter paper to remove any newly formed manganese dioxide. The filter paper wasn't getting all the dioxide out, so I used a 0.45 micron syringe filter to make sure it's all out. Once I have a clear solution, I cool it to room temperature and then acidify it carefully using 20% aqueous sulfuric acid until it turns slightly red to litmus paper. Acidifying causes the p acetaminobenzoic acid to precipitate out of solution. It's always satisfying to see a solid suddenly crash out like this. I collect the product by vacuum filtration and press it dry under suction. My final yield is about 6.7 grams. I take the p acetaminobenzoic acid I made earlier and weigh out the full amount for the next step. To break the mean bond and regenerate the free amine, I need a strong acid and some heat. So I transfer the solid into a 250ml round bottle flask and add 33.5ml of 18% hydrochloric acid. This solution was made by mixing equal volumes of concentrated HCl and water. The acid acts as a catalyst and provides the necessary protons to help cleave the amine during hydrolysis. I fit a reflux condenser on the flask. This lets me heat the mixture without losing any of the volatile compounds like HCl. I place the flask onto a heating mantle and gently boil the mixture for about 30 minutes. The heat helps drive the reaction to completion by providing energy needed to break the stable amine bond. Throughout this step, I keep an eye on the condenser to make sure everything is cycling properly and there's no leakage. After hydrolysis is complete, I turn off the heat and allow the mixture to cool slightly. Then I dilute the reaction by adding 15 milliliters of cold water. This helps bring the solution to a manageable concentration and also cools it down for preparation in the next step. I stir the mixture to ensure it's well even mixed. Next, I slowly add 45 milliliters of 10% aqueous ammonia. This makes the solution slightly alkaline, neutralizing the excess acid, allowing P-aminobenzoic acid, also called PABA, to dissolve in its protonated form. Now to precipitate the PABA in its pure neutral form, I add 3.25 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. This gently acidifies the solution, bringing it back towards neutral, encouraging crystallization of the free acid. I stir vigorously while doing this to ensure the acid evenly mix and prevents localized pH swings. Then I chill the solution in an ice bath to maximize the yield and help the crystals form. Once the crystals form, I collect them on vacuum filtration and press out as much liquid as possible. The final yield of P-aminobenzoic acid is about 2.1 grams. PABA is a particularly valuable chemical in organic chemistry. As a versatile building block, its aromatic ring and accessible amine and carboxylic acid function groups make it an excellent precursor in synthesis of dyes, pharmaceuticals, and polymers. For example, PABA derivatives are commonly used intermediates in synthesizing local anesthetics, like we're doing next. PABA also plays a significant role in development of azo dyes, UV blocking compounds and sunscreens, and antimicrobial agents. Its ease of functionalization allows chemists to explore numerous synthetic pathways, making it an indispensable reagent for many types of chemistry. Now we're on to the formation of benzocaine. I start by placing 2 grams of P-aminobenzoic acid into a 100 ml round bottom flask. To this I add 20 ml of ethanol, which both acts as the solvent and as the reactant in the esterification process. 
I then carefully add 1.5 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid to the mixture. Since sulfuric acid is highly corrosive and reacts exothermically with water and alcohol, I add it slowly, drop by drop, while stirring the flask. The sulfuric acid catalyzes the Fischer esterification reaction by protonating the carboxylic acid group, making it more electrophilic, and thus more reactive towards ethanol. Next I attach a reflux condenser to the flask and heat the mixture gently under reflux for about an hour. Refluxing allows the reaction to proceed at a high constant temperature without losing any solvent due to evaporation. The mixture continuously boils and condenses cycling back into the flask. After about an hour, I remove the heat and allow the solution to cool to room temperature. Once it's cooled, I neutralize the acid by slowly adding solution of sodium carbonate. This part is a bit dramatic. There's vigorous foaming as the carbon dioxide gas is released. I add the base gradually, stirring between additions to avoid overflow. Neutralization stops the acid-catalyzed reaction and makes the mixture more safe to handle. Once neutralized, I extract the reaction mixture using 20 milliliter portions of methylene chloride. This nonpolar solvent pulls the ester product out of the aqueous layer into the organic phase. I combine the methylene chloride extracts, which contain our product along with some water. To take care of that water, I throw some molecular sieves. This will pull out the water. Once the methylene chloride was dry, I decant the material into a different beaker. Now I remove the methylene chloride by distilling using a steam bath. The steam bath provides gentle even heating that won't overheat the product. As the solvent evaporates, residue of the ester is left behind. I then let the product cool down to room temperature and it crystallizes. The product was then collected with a yield of 2.3 grams of pure ester. This class of esters is quite common in pain management, especially in the realm of local anesthetics. Compounds like procaine, better known as novocaine and lidocaine, are both derivatives of this chemistry, each with tailored structures that influence their potency, duration, and application. Now for my favorite part, confirming that I've actually synthesized what I'm claiming to synthesize, instrumental analysis. I saved small samples from each of the synthesis for this purpose. Now we're going to run GCMS to verify their identity. I transfer small amounts of each material into a GCMS vial. Then I add dichloromethane to the vials. These vials were then loaded into the auto sampler and ran. Each sample takes around 16 minutes to run, so through the power of editing, I jump ahead to when all the samples are done. Each sample has a peak which corresponds to the compound that was detected. I then analyze the data and use a library to match up the compounds detected with what they actually are. This confirms synthesis of each compound and our successful synthesis of benzocaine. Originally, I planned to synthesize both benzocaine and procaine in this video, since in theory, converting benzocaine to procaine should be straightforward transesterification. But as often as it happens in chemistry, things don't go exactly as planned. I ran into a few unexpected challenges, which you'll get to see in next week's video, where we dive fully into the synthesis of novocaine. And if you're curious about where all this leads, stick around for the following week where we take a look at the synthesis of lidocaine. Thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something new today.